or good afternoon or right at the in between the two. So let's go ahead and get this started. Let's open with a word of prayer. Oh, our gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much that you are our God. And you have you have created so many things for us, and you have a way that you want us to live and to honor you and to serve you. And you've provided everything that we need. And I just thank you for that. Lord, I just pray for today that your your Holy Spirit would help us to understand some truths that you have for us to learn. And um, that we would be able to take some things away from, um, home and to know better who you are and how you want us to live. And I just thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to do a little bit of a review for last week. Um, who can remember some of the rules that we covered for last week for this class? Do you remember? <laughs> what happens in class stays in class. What happens in class stays in class, okay? No backbiting. Not necessarily. You know, if it's a good health thing, you can share that. <laughs> but, um... Do not judge, judge a... Right, <laughs> right. For discussion, discussion and sharing, okay. not judgmental. Right. Mm. Yep, you got a bunch of that. I'm just going to go over them. I had five rules. The first one is I want this to be a discussion and not a lecture. However, today is not going along with that very well. I mean, we're going to have some discussion, but, but it's, it's not coming out the way I had intended. I intended this to be more of a discussion, but the Lord has laid some stuff on my heart that I'm going to share. And so, um, in this foundational stuff, we're, we're not really sharing about how you know, what you can do for to improve your health right now, it's not going to be as much of a discussion. Mm -hmm. But it will, the intent is, when we get into more of those things, we will have a broader discussion. But anyway, then I shared the idea that when we get into some of those health things, and even maybe on some of the stuff that's brought up today, who knows? Um, there's going to be controversial ideas. And the reason that there's going to be controversy is we were all raised differently. We've, we've been taught things differently. Um, we've had different experiences. All of those things are going to lead to, they all lead to our beliefs and what we believe. And I, I can tell you, not, one, not two people in this room believe the same about everything. Okay? And because of that, there's going to be controversy. But when there is controversy, we need to learn not to, not to argue, not to get upset with someone else, um, but we need to discuss those issues, both sides. You know, we need to discuss them rather than just say, oh, they're wrong, or get mad at them, or, because we're, we're going to have those things that come up, but we need to learn how to discuss them. We're not going to put other people down because they don't see the, the things the way I see them, okay? We're not going to put them down. And especially when we go out of this class, we're not going to talk about them behind, our, behind their back. All of that stuff is going to be put behind us. So we talked last week also that there are two worldviews, the biblical worldview and what we believe about, about God and the Bible, and the secular worldview out there that is following Satan. They, they won't tell you they're following Satan, but they are. If they're not following God, they're following Satan. And sometimes we have a hard time distinguishing between the two. Sometimes, because we were raised a lot of times with that secular view, it carries over into, into the things that we do now. And what we believe affects the way we respond. And so that's why we're going to be working on some stuff to make sure that we believe rightly so that we can make right choices about our health. That's all. Anyway. Um, and in doing that, um, we talked last week, we, we, I, I read from a, a book, an introduction from a book called More Than a Healer last week. 
And in that, we talked about why Jesus came. Can you remember why? What was his purpose in coming to earth? What's his main purpose in coming to heal our hurts? To save us. To save us. We need to remember that that is the main reason Jesus came. The main reason was not to heal us. Yes, he did heal. And yes, he still heals. And, and all of those things. But that's not the main reason. His main thing that Jesus has is he wants us to be in heaven with him. That's the main thing. And we've got to keep that in mind when we're um, talking about a bunch of different things here. And yes, we have hurts, and we want those hurts to be healed. And it, it's really hard sometimes thinking about it when we're, we're mm -hmm. dealing with the hurt. It's hard to get past that sometimes. But we need to remember that that's not the main reason. That's not the main thing out there. Um, he came to do so much more than heal. Um, and it's not just our physical that needs healing. He came to heal our souls and our spirits and everything. All of those things, the whole person. And without his death on the cross, none of that was possible, right? right. And there was no way that we could get to heaven without him coming. No way. And that is the most important thing that we need to remember and that all these other things are just extras. Your benefits and stuff. So, one big question that people all around the world have, and that is, and I'm sure you've heard this mm -hmm. in, more, in more ways than one, why, if God is a God of love, why would he allow so much human suffering? And it's a big stumbling block for a lot of people, and when people come to that issue, it's a divided line. Yeah. They either gravitate toward God, or they gravitate the other way and say, I don't want anything to do with a God that, that is mean and allows all that stuff. I don't want that God. I want a God of love. And they, they're not able to reconcile that. Um, I gave you a handout, a couple handouts today. One is an article that came to me this week from Chosen People, and it just fit along with what we're talking about. So I gave that to you to take home and read. Okay? So you can just take that home and read because it was a really good article. Um, and then the other one is a handout that I gave you that has some... some Discussion, a couple of questions with some points, and I'm gonna I'm gonna read some stuff, and it's some. If you want to take notes, it's a place to take notes. So that's what that is. This question that we're dealing with: Why, if God is so loving, would He allow all this human suffering? That is actually a question that came to my my way when my sister-in-law Rita, when her husband was dying. And her children asked me that question, and I did my best to share that with them. But it didn't get through. And they have turned from God. They want nothing to do with him. And it's so hard. It's so hard. And they, they things come up. It wasn't just it wasn't just Gary dying. It was other friends that they had had. How could God, if he is loving, how could he allow that kind of things to happen? Yes. It drove me to his arms. Yes. As it pushed me on yep. my knees, I didn't have anything It'll do else. one way or the other. Uh, there was nothing mm -hmm. I could do on my own. Mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah. Yeah. Yep. It'll do one way or the other. So it, it depends on how we resolve that question in our hearts as to whether it drives us toward God or away from God. So, um, and Satan would love nothing more than to use it to drive it, us away from God. And so it's something that we need to, to resolve in our hearts. So last week I told you that I plan to talk about reasons that God allows sickness and disease. And yes, we're going to cover a little bit of that. But as I began to prayer, uh, prepare, um, let's, uh, is it charging now? No, I, 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 
I closed the window. Oh, okay. It, it doesn't give you an option except to do that. So okay, well, maybe some of you who are close can keep an eye on it. And if it comes up again, then we will try another receptacle to see. So hopefully it will get recorded this time. So I am, um, so anyway, there's that article that I gave you. Today, the Lord has led me in a different direction. Um, and it's a, it's such an important question. We're going to deal some with that other question, but another question that, that comes up to me that this is going to cover is the idea of faith healing. And this is a big mm -hmm. issue. Um, I know I mm -hmm. grapp grappled with it through the years. When we couldn't have a son, I grappled with this. You know, people would say, you just don't have enough faith. Mm -hmm. <laughs> don't have enough faith. Oh, and I, I searched I scripture trying to find out what God had to say about, about the faith. I went through the faith chapter in Hebrews. I went through all kinds of things. I went to the Lord in prayer. I asked him. I grappled with it. It's going to be brought up in this um, chapter. I'm going to read chapter 1 out of this book that I read last week, the intro from. And I'm going to read chapter 1 today. And then I'm going to tell you who it's from. I'm not going to tell you who it is yet, who the author is, because I don't want you to get clouded. Because um, of the family that he comes, you, you would recognize the name. And, and um, he's going to bring some of that up. He does not follow his family. And so anyway. And today is like some of the ch um, lessons that we had this summer. Jehovah Rapha. He is our healer. And that is the name of this lesson today. It's He is Healer. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Matthew 14, 14. On August 16, 2018, the clock on the stove read 7.30 p.m., just after we put the kids to bed. It had been a typical and wildly fun night in our busy home. At the time, we had three children ages four, two, and three months old. As with many growing families, our evening moves swiftly through the series of tasks that can sometimes feel like running through the obstacle, an obstacle course. First, there was playtime when I get home from work. Then dinner time, bath time, cleanup time, family worship, complete with some reading, prayer, singing, and cheesy dance moves. <laughs> and then the kids go down for bed. Of course, they, um, there are always a few mishaps along the way when a diaper explodes or controversy <laughs> ensues over stolen toys, like ducks that um, smoothly glide across the pond while underneath their feet paddle with frantic effort. My wife and I try to maintain a calm and steady demeanor through much of this, all the while secretly laughing and cherishing, cherishing and at times holding back impatience. After all, these boys will soon be over, these days will soon be over, and with quieter evenings and fewer um, carpet strain, uh, stains, I'm sure we'll long for one more night of kid-filled games. Most nights after the kids go down, we share a few sentiments and have a good laugh over their antics before spending quality time together or doing some other productive task. But that late summer evening proved to be different. I had found my way into the kitchen while my wife, Christine, finished putting Timothy into his crib. As the baby of the family, he was still getting Mommy's special bedtime routine filled with extra cuddles, a favorite song, and a double check on his diapers to make sure he was dry. Beyond that, Christine was keeping a keen eye on some red spots that had been spreading and had begun to mature into something different from a regular rash on his body. There were now more than a dozen. When um, Just a couple weeks ago, or, um, earlier there were only a few. 
we had decided a biopsy to biopsy one of the larger red spots a week prior. Was it just a rash? A skin condition? Maybe he was allergic to something. Speculation would do us no good, so we waited for the results. After Christine put Timothy to bed, she logged into our health healthcare account and saw that the results had been shared with us earlier that day. She sent the document to our home printer, picked it up, and brought it to me as I stood in the kitchen. Timothy has cancer, she said. Her voice broke in tears as tears filled her eyes. Cancer? How do you know? Are you sure? It felt like someone had um, sucked every ounce of oxygen out of the room. She held up the report. I found the results posted in our account. I don't think they expected um, us to see them just yet, but I have been checking every day. I don't know why, but I just knew it was something serious. I looked up the technical terms on his report. It's a rare form of cancer. The tears flooded and flowed as, as I hugged her. We held each other in silence until I said the only thing that kept coming to mind. We were never going to get out of this life unscathed. She shook her head. Now we're going to live what we've been preaching. There was only thing, one thing we could do. We prayed. Ironically, for several years, we've been telling others that God is still good, even when things in life are not. We've made it clear that following Jesus and being a Christian doesn't guarantee health, wealth, and happiness. We stood for truth and pushed back against greedy faith healers who exploited people with false promises, and we, pay, and we paid the price for doing so. But compared with facing our child's cancer, Every difficulty in our life leading up to this point seemed easy. It felt like all we'd ever stood to lose before was money and family approval. All we'd ever give, um, given up was our old life filled with ill-gotten gains in exchange for the greatest treasure of all, Jesus. To be honest, we never felt like we had anything to lose since we were gaining him. But now, would we lose our little baby boy? It's one thing to suffer or deal with trials personally, but nothing prepares you for the day you hear the C word and your child's name in the same sentence. Christine and I desperately needed and wanted Jesus to be the healer that we knew he was. While not presuming that he allowed us healing, um, that, he, that he owed us healing, as I once believed that he did. Questions filled my mind. How will our families react? What will my family say? What terrible timing, just as we were pushing against the abuses by faith healers, will those faith healers and their followers use this as ammunition to say, see, you touched the Lord's anointed and now look what's happened. I wouldn't have to wait long to get the answers to those questions. We decided to patiently and carefully break the news to certain family members. It was important for us that we have time to pray, process, and then disclose to those outside our immediate circle of friends. One evening at a large, larger gathering of family members, I sat down with several to explain what lay ahead and express the certainty of God's comfort in such an uncertain time. The news about Timothy was swiftly met. In Jesus' name, he's healed. It's already paid for. No cancer will touch this. The remark would not would have ended with the word house, but the sentence stopped in its tracks. My wife, my wife jumped in to hold our ground before I could say anything. It was so outside her personality that I still remember being both shocked and proud of her. We have been praying and will continue to pray for healing, she said firmly. But we will trust in the Lord. And cancer has touched this house. 
We don't want Timothy to die, but no matter what, even if our son dies, God is still good. Not a single word of pushback followed. Several weeks later, one extended family member reached out to me and asked, isn't there any part of you that sees the cancer as a result of touching the Lord's anointed? He was referring to the idea that speaking out against church leaders, even those who propagate abuses and deception, invites divine consequences. My blood boiled at the suggestion that Timothy had been struck by God with cancer. But I replied calmly, no. I trust that God has a plan and a purpose in all of this. No matter the outcome, he is good. He is sovereign, and he certainly can heal our son if he chooses to. I understood, he responded, I understand, he responded, and that was that. While our family may not have said all they were thinking, they'd said enough. If anything, these conversations proved to be a microcosm of a wider way of thinking in our world today. With so many faith healers pounding the airways with false promises and with various degrees of the prosperity gospel finding, us, finding its way into our churches, countless Christians have at one point or another believed the lie that God is good when things are good and that he is punishing them when things are not. We may even believe that because we are Christians, God owes us a healthy and happy life and must heal us on request. Perhaps no other experience in our life exposes how we really think about Jesus like sickness does. Everybody struggles with viewing Jesus in transactional ways. If Timothy's cancer has taught us one thing, it is that God owes us nothing. His grace doesn't guarantee healing, and it doesn't guarantee a perfect life. We've also been reminded that Jesus' healing ministry gets some really bad press these days. For the rest of this chapter, I promise to help you discover or rediscover truths that will silence the noise you've heard and the lies that you've been told about Jesus and his healing ministry. After that, I want to offer you some practical questions for reflection, which you can use to search your heart and seek comfort from Christ. The healing debate. Plenty of opinions about healing, of divine healing, muddy the waters of truth and steal the joyful assurance that God cares about your pain. With uh, lots of nuance in between, two extremes tend to make the most noise in the church today. Extreme one, it's always God's will to heal right now. This view is held by faith healing enthusiasts who teach that something is wrong with your faith if you're sick. They teach that your lack of faith is the problem or that you aren't giving enough money to activate the blessing of divine healing in your life. Or sin. Right. Still others claim that your healing is already completed and paid for by Christ's death on the cross. You simply need to start speaking it into reality and say, I am healed. <laughs> that thinking is where we get the phrase, name it and claim it. Last, as our family's case, as in our family's case, some people believe that you would have been healed if you hadn't spoken against faith healers. I used to believe and propagate these hurtful lies. Extreme number two, Jesus doesn't heal at all. This view obviously is held by atheists and others who don't acknowledge the existence of God. But it is also held by Christians who believe that God doesn't heal anymore. The, um, the technical term for this belief is full cessation, cessationism, which teaches that God doesn't do any miracle, uh, miracles today. Our supernatural God isn't supernatural these days. This view is as foolish as it sounds. God is a supernatural God and most certainly still heals and works miracles today. Does that mean every miracle um, claim, a miraculous claim, is legitimate? No, but we should not assume a 
hold on for dear life until Jesus comes back mentality. This view crushes the hearts of the sick and the hurting because it misses the truth about divine healing. If you believe in God, you must believe that he is supernatural because he is. Both of these extreme views fall terribly short of what God has made clear in the Bible. Worst of all, they put words in Jesus' mouth. Jesus can and does heal today, but that doesn't mean he is obligated to do so. Still, do not ever give ear to someone who claims that God does not heal today. One of his names in the Bible is Jehovah Rapha, which is um, used in Exodus 15, 26, to identify God as the one who heals the sick. The God of the Improbable. I have a dear friend who is exactly the kind of friend you'd like to have. His name is Daniel, and aside from being a Raiders fan, there's nothing that you wouldn't like about him. He is kind, prayerful, loving, generous, loyal, dependable. To this day, whenever we talk, it's as though we were together just yesterday, even though he now lives in Colorado and I am in Arizona. But before time apart and physical distance marked our friendship, we were together in Southern California. When my wife and I first came to the church in Orange County, we were a small, in a small group with Daniel and his wife, Daniela. Yes, their names are real and adorably close. We loved them dearly and still do, which is why it struck our hearts so deeply when Daniel was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. But his diagnosis wasn't the final word. I'll let Daniel take it from here. My cancer story starts well before my condition was diagnosed. In the fall of 2012, I had landed my dream job at Open Doors USA, a nonprofit that helps persecuted Christians around the world. Almost immediately after I was hired, my wife Danielle and I traveled to Columbia to check out a project. And while we were there, we fell in love with the church. We wanted to go back to visit um, as soon as possible office to press the issue. This time, I was given a blood test and told that I would get my results in a few weeks. After not hearing back from my doctor, and because I was shortly going to Columbia, I decided to call so that I could get the news that all was well. The doctor, however, did not tell me that all was well. Rather, he told me that I was anemic and would need a colonoscopy that, to figure out why. When we reached Columbia in February of 2013, the staff that remembered me from our previous visit made comments about how I did not look well. Funny how others can, could tell, but I couldn't. What I did notice, though, was how exhausted I felt and how I had to miss out on a few activities because of my fatigue. Upon our return to the United States, I began my follow-up appointments. After my colonoscopy, the GI doctor who listened to my wife's concerns about the swollen lymph nodes on my neck immediately ordered a biopsy. When my family heard about my need for a biopsy, my brother and his family drove from Colorado to California to be there with us. Though I was still convinced it was nothing, and we um, filled up that biopsy waiting room like it was a family reunion, the results, though, were far from joyous. I can still remember the day vividly. I remember the gray sky and look on my wife's face and the absolute breakdown she had when the doctor told us that it was cancer, Hodgkin's lymphoma to be exact. exact. Immediately, the cancer treatment preparations began. Our doctor recommended that we freeze my sperm to help ensure that we could have kids in the future. I had never considered that chemo would affect my fertility. What nobody knew was that Daniela had already been told by her doctor that she was infertile. Would we have liked to, um, kids of our own? Sure. But to be honest, we knew that adoption or opportunities like living in Columbia would be possible if she didn't have kids. All in all, we didn't see the inability to have our own children as a negative, but more as a fact. 
We simply trusted God's will. If God wanted us to have kids, he'd cause us to have kids. But for now, the doctor said it wasn't going to happen. My first session of chemotherapy started on May 2nd, and I was scheduled to have a chemo session every two weeks until October 3rd. I remember in the midst of chemo, actually being excited for the opportunity to go through it. It was as if this was my, was my time to show the world what I really believed about God, to be, a spectac to be a spectacle for the world to see so that I could honor God. I, couldn't I can't quite explain what it was like, but I believe that the empowering of the Holy Spirit gave me joy and excitement to have been accept ex selected for this trial. I was also deeply encouraged because we were closely, uh, clearly not alone. Our church family, as well as our blood family, supported us in whatever way we needed. They brought us meals, drove and accompanied me to my chemo sessions, prayed with us and for us, and the list goes on. We even received gifts from people we'd never met before and still haven't met to this day. To say that cancer wasn't a burden for me would be an accurate statement. Um, but for Daniela, it was devastating. We often say our cancer story was harder on her than on me. So how did Dania, Daniel's story end? By December 14, 19, uh, 2014, doctors declared his, him he was cancer-free. The treatments had worked. But that wasn't the supernatural part. Along with Daniel's being cancer-free, Daniela was pregnant. The impossible thing that doctors said would never happen had happened. That was nothing short of God's power and grace on our lives. <clears throat> Jesus, the great physician, saw fit to use doctors and chemo to heal one issue and to leave doctors speechless concerning the other. How did it happen? Did God perform a divine surgery? Were the doctors wrong? Did Daniela's body heal itself? These questions are valid. Regardless of the speculation, the reality remains the same. Something happened that was out of the ordinary. Refreshingly, there was no fanfare or faith healing spectacle. My purpose in sharing Daniel and Daniela's story is not to give you the false hope or to be sensationalistic about it, but to help you stay balanced and humble in our approach to the subject of healing. Their story is an encouraging reminder to me that God can work in impossible ways that go beyond our comprehension. He works powerfully through doctors. He works powerfully without doctors. He can overcome any obstacle, and he can do what human opinions say cannot be done. My guess is that you know people who've experienced similar um, breakthroughs. But does that mean it's always God's will to heal right now? What about people who are sick for years? If Jesus paid for sickness on the cross, then why don't we instantly get healed when we are saved by faith in him? If God is always good, isn't healing guaranteed? He most certainly is good, and he is the God of guarantees, the God who keeps his promises, but his guarantees for healing don't necessarily mean we'll like the timing. In the next two sections of this chapter, I want to address two big questions about sickness and healing. The first question is, why do people get sick? And the second is, is it always God's will to heal right now? So this is where I handed out you that flyer or that page to you that you can put um, down some notes if you wish. Wet my throat there, I'm starting to get a little dry. Yeah, you can put any notes down there you want. So, first big question, why do people get sick? This is one of the most pressing questions when it comes to healing, and it must be answered by using the scriptures. Opinions and abuses abound, so the only way to address this question is to cement ourselves in the truth of God's unchanging word. <clears throat> I've seen it time and time again, and I'm sure you have too. A well-renowned faith healer hits the news after promising to heal people, but only if they pay up first. 
Some even go so far as to say that God is going to pour down judgment if people don't give a certain amount of money. These healers appear to have all the answers for sickness. Years ago, I sat through many services in which a faith healer explained to people why they were sick. Some people were told that they weren't giving enough money. Others, apparently, were not forgiving people. And others had been spending time with negative people. And others had, oops, let's see, not only that, but some were said to be sick because they just didn't have enough faith. This sort of guesswork breaks hearts. Um, it leads lives astray and spirit, um, supernaturally, or spiritually abuses desperate people. I had someone say to me, what horrible sin did you commit that your right. son is like that? Yeah, and we learned from the book of Job that we studied last year that it, all sickness doesn't come necessarily from sin. There are other reasons for it. So thankfully, the Bible breaks such deceptive bondage. If you've ever been confused about why people get sick, or you know someone who needs answers, the following truths will be a soothing balm to a weary soul. Truth one, sickness and death entered the world through original sin. On the sixth day of creation, the Bible tells us God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Genesis 1, 31. Notice it doesn't say some of what he made was very good. It says all. There was no sin in the world. Sickness did not exist. And Adam and Eve were, were set to enjoy a flawless life complete with a perfect re uh, relationship with God. Instead... They were deceived by the serpent and disobeyed the one command that God had given them to follow. That is what is called original sin, because it was the first sin the world had ever known. And it resulted in a fractured relationship between God and his creation. That's talked about in Genesis 3, 1 through 19. Because of sin, fear and shame came upon humanity in verse 7 of chapter 3 there. And 10. Marital relationships experience conflict, verse 16. Um, women experienced pain in childbirth, verse 16. And work became incredibly difficult, verses 17 through 18. Worst of all, death entered the scene and humankind would uh, return to the dust, verse 19. Sickness and death are the result of sin and the fallen world we live in. Because of sin, we need to save you. And while true Christianity looks forward to that day when Jesus will return and restore all things, until then, we must realize that sickness and death are part of this temporary life. Thankfully, eternal life knows nothing of such things. Truth two, sickness and death can strike us because of our own sin. Using the Bible again, let's face the truth that sickness and death can strike us through our sin. In 1 Corinthians 11, 27-30, Paul says that taking communion in an unworthy manner is the reason why some people are weak, sick, or asleep, a biblical expression for death. This is a statement made directly um, to the New Testament church. Taking communion unworthily includes not taking it seriously, not examining oneself as Paul instructs in verse 28, or having impure motives, or having unconfessed deliberate sin, and being embittered and unforgiving toward others, the very opposite of what communion represents, since we've been forgiven. Another reason why sickness and death can result from sin is based on the law of consequences. The idea that a man reaps what he sows, Galatians 6, 7. If you do drugs, drink and drive, act foolishly and belligerently, take poor care of your body, engage in rampant and casual sex outside of marriage, um, might you not at some point experience sickness or death, often prematurely? Sin often does lead to these things. Therefore, when we examine our lives and the reason for some unfortunate experiences, we must be sure to know the difference between what is self-inflicted sickness or death and what is a genuine trial or tribulation 
that we did nothing to cause. Those are talked about in James 1, 2 through 4, and Romans 5, 3 through 5. This is why they asked me that. What horrible sin did you commit? Right, right. Should you find yourself convicted by the Holy Spirit concerning sin that is causing your sickness, take hold of Jesus' beautiful grace. Confess your sin, and he will forgive you and cleanse you. It talks about that in 1 John 1, 9. And then you should go to the elders of your church and ask them to pray for you, as well as confess your sin and be honest with them about your situation. James 5, 13 through 16. God's word says that in this context, the prayer of a righteous person, person has great power. That's in verse 16. <clears throat> Truth number three. Sickness and death are not always the result of our sin. It's impossible to diagnose the reason for someone's sickness, but we could certainly say that most, if not all, of God's loving, <coughs> sin-confessing, Jesus-believing Christians are not sick, who are sick, fall into this third category. If original sin isn't the only culprit, then a certain situation in Jesus' ministry can shed some light on why some are sick. The Gospel of John recounts the story. This is in John 9, 1 through 7. As Jesus went along, he saw a blind a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming. When no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the, with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. Um, this word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. This story is an incredible lesson to all of us that what we might think is the reason for sickness isn't always the reason. Our finite human wisdom gets, only, gets us only so far. Jesus makes it clear that God's purposes and ways are far above our pay grade, and that we do not control his plan and schedule. Sometimes God allows certain things or determines how long a circumstance will last so that he can showcase his infinite power and wisdom and reveal more of himself to us. We wouldn't praise him if his uh, for his mercy if we weren't aware of his wrath. We wouldn't appreciate his love for sinners if we didn't realize his hatred of sin. In the same way, we couldn't begin to glorify him for his healing hand if we didn't experience or see sickness. This leads us to the fourth and final truth in this section. Buckle up. You may not like it at first. God, uh, truth four. God can use sickness and death for his glory and the good of others. Just because God is not the cruel or origi uh, originator of sickness does not mean that he can't use it. He is God, and nothing is outside of his scope of authority. Sin may have brought sickness into the world, but God gets the final word. You might be thinking, I've lost my mind to think that God could somehow bring something good out of sickness. But before you give up on me, let's dig deeper. For starters, nowhere in scripture do you find God to be a cosmic abuser who gets joy out of striking his children with sickness in the name of growth and glory. That is not what this truth means. However, the Bible does give us a hopeful perspective about sickness, suffering, trials, and even death that helps us shift from the broken pieces these often leave at our feet. God is strong enough, wise enough, and powerful enough to bring purpose out of our pain, even if he doesn't take us out of the pain right away. You and I experience 
experience this more often than we realize. Whenever someone we know dies, it can lead either to bitterness toward God or to our appreciation of the gift of relationships and the life we've been given. Of course, the grieving process may be arduous, but he never leaves us there alone. Furthermore, our grief often matures us to a place where we are able to encourage and support others when they go through what we have gone through. Romans 8.28 says, We know that in all things God works that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. This passage is often thrown around as a broad promise that everything is going to turn out the way we want it to. But God wants us to understand important truths from it before we jump to conclusions. First, all things means good, the bad, and the ugly. It, I think sometimes we miss that fact and jump right to thinking God is going to make everything perfect. God doesn't promise that nothing bad will happen to us. But he does promise that in all those things, they work together for good. And remember whose definition of good we are talking about here. His. Which means that however God chooses to, to define good is what is ultimately best even if we don't always understand it at the time. All things includes a cancer diagnosis. And good could mean that you are going to pray more than ever before and be closer to Jesus than you've ever been. All things includes losing a loved one. And good could be the opportunity you have to share the hope and saving love of Jesus Christ at the funeral. All things includes the loss of a child. And good could mean the beginning of a ministry to parents who are grieving the loss of children. My friend Nancy Guth uh, Guthrie is the author of numerous resources on grief, suffering, and God's character. <clears throat> she recently wrote, God does his best work with empty and has experienced exactly what this fourth truth is all about. She and her husband David endured two all things. One was the doctor's report stating that their newborn daughter, Hope, had a rare metabolic disorder and would not let, live past her first birthday. And the second with their newborn child, Gabriel, who lived 183 days. As for God bringing out good through all of this, he chose to bring purpose to their pain by using Nancy and David to speak to hundreds of thousands of grieving parents who need hope in the midst of their own tragedies and loss. Does anyone ever pray to lose a daughter and a son in order to gain a life-changing ministry? Never! But Nancy's perspective on why she wrote her first book about their family's story shows us what God can do in the midst of, even through, our deepest pain. She says, I wrote the book not to exploit our baby's lives, but to use our experience, like Job, to address the question of suffering. To what purpose? What is it God wants to do in you and through you that could possibly cost you this much? The ability to surrender our lives to Jesus is the mark of spiritual maturity. The right perspective on who Jesus is will cause us to raise our hands and surrender, saying, Jesus, this situation hurts, and I don't know all the answers, but I know that you can take pain and turn it into purpose. So, have your way. Thy will be done. You are the potter, I am the clay. Turn this situation around so that it brings blessing to others and glory to your name. Whatever that looks like is fine with me. We need to pray for the um, greatest good, a practice endorsed by legendary um, Harvard graduate theologian and pastor James Montgomery Boyce <coughs> on Sunday, May 7, 2000, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Boyce took the pulpit to address his congregation um, countless 
members of 10th Presbyterian Church had been asking how they might serve and pray for him during his battle with terminal cancer. What Boyce said that Sunday captures the perspective which can come only from spending time with Jesus and cultivating a life that emulates the humility and surrender of the healer himself. Of the healer himself. He explained, A number of you have asked what you can do, and it strikes me that what you can do, you are doing. This is a good congregation, and you do the right things. You are praying, certainly, and I've been um, as assured by that by many. And I know of many meetings that have been going on. A relevant question, I guess, when you pray is, pray for what? Should you pray for a miracle? Well, you're free to do that, of course. My general impression is that God is able to do miracles, and he certainly can, is also able to keep you from getting the problem in the first place. So, although miracles do happen, they're rare by definition, a miracle has to be, has to be an unusual thing. I think it's far more profitable to pray for wisdom for the doctors. Doctors have a great deal of experience, of course, in their expertise, but they're not omniscient. They do make mistakes, and, they, and then also for the effectiveness of the treatment. Sometimes it does very well, and sometimes not so well, and that's certainly a legitimate thing to pray for. Above all, I would say pray for the glory of God. If you think of God glorifying, him, glorifying himself in history, and you say, where in all of history has God most glorified himself? He did it at the cross of Jesus Christ. And it wasn't by delivering Jesus from the cross, though he could have. Jesus said, don't you think I could call down from my father ten legions of angels for my defense? But he didn't do that. And yet that's where God is most glorified. These four biblical truths are helpful, but they are also extremely humbling. In the end, we won't always have the answers, but we can certainly have the answer. Jesus can and will cause anything and everything to work out for good. We must remember what that is. Or, <clears throat> okay. Okay. Hopefully we're, hopefully we're live again. It's got me. Oh. <laughs> Um, there. <laughs> okay. Techie stuff. I hate it. <laughs> but there's but a reason. There's a reason. But anyway, so let's go on. I don't know when it, sh when it shut off. You were at point two, I think. We're, yeah. So I don't know how much of the last one we missed. But we're going to start with question two. We need to rotate it. Oh, great. How do you rotate it? I don't know. Okay. Well, let's try this. Let's see if I can. Okay. Is it rotated now? Is it the right way there's or is it upside down? There's a delay. you got to wait for it. Do it. Okay, See, that's it okay. Goes. Now, if I, I don't know that I can get this up, it's it's not going to do it. It's not going to fit in there that direction. Okay. Then rotate your phone. Okay. I'm going to let you do that, and I'm going to look at this. And it's still being squirrely. Oh, wait, we're still on delay. Get your legs. Done. I don't know what that is. Um, nope. That wasn't it. Maybe people will have to... Maybe people will have to uh, rotate their own phone. <laughs> I don't know. Um, well, we'll have to figure this out, I think, for next week. 
But let's go ahead and finish up here because it's almost one o'clock and I want to get this done. So, so, okay. Second big question, is it always God's will to heal right now? On a family camping trip in California not long ago, I met a faith healer in the most unlikely ways. Our first night on the campground, a man walked up to my campsite out of the blue, introduced himself, sat down, and spent the better half of two hours telling me about his divine healing ministry. Though um, made aware of it, he had not fortunately, he could talk about the theories, but couldn't practice what he preached. As the night wore on, I mentioned that I was a pastor, which only uh, further excited him. He eventually offered me 400 of his books for our church, discounted, of course, to help our people take hold of healing power. Not long after that, I revealed my knowing a thing or two about faith healing and faith healers. <laughs> after a firm yet loving encouragement regarding his wayward teachings, we said goodnight. He did not come back, though I certainly would have welcomed a spirited follow-up discussion. A perusal of certain Christian television networks tells us a similar story. There you'll find healing televangelists claiming that he is always, it is always God's will to heal you right now, if the price is right. So, is it always God's will to heal right now? Let's look at four simple truths from the Bible that will liberate you from hurt, hurtful, um, the hurtful burden of believing something is wrong with you if you aren't receiving your healing just yet. Truth one, God doesn't heal everyone all the time. The most important starting point for any discussion on healing is the affirmation that though God does heal, he doesn't heal everyone all the time. The Bible gives irrefutable evidence to support this. During Jesus' earthly healing ministry, <clears throat> he didn't always heal everyone. Je Jesus healed just one man out of a multitude of sick people at the pool of Bethesda, John 5, 3 through 8. And didn't heal people in his hometown of Nazareth, Matthew 13, 58. After a healing spree in the district of Galilee, Jesus plainly decided to move on, even though desperately sick and hurting people were looking for him. His reason was simple. Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. Mark 1.38 Christ didn't come to earth merely to hold a healing crusade. He came to bring salvation. More on that in a later chapter. That God doesn't heal someone all the time is clear from the life of Jesus. It is also clear from the writings of the most prolific apostle who authored 13 New Testament books. Paul, uh, he could perform miracles, yet he told Timothy to take wine for his stomach. 1 Timothy 5.23 he, uh, why didn't the apostle exercise his gift of healing? Paul also left one of his faithful ministry teammates, Trophimus, sick at Miletus in 2 Timothy 4.20. Why didn't he heal him and bring him, bring him along? Clearly, God heals as he wills, and his healing power is not a formula for anyone uh, that anyone can master. Truth two, God doesn't heal based solely on one's faith. Can you believe your way into getting healed? This view on faith healing is first popularized in the early 20th century by faith healing evangelists. Though I am sure it happened before radio and television took it into the mainstream. These individuals made a lot of money off people by making them repeat customers to their healing crusades. If someone didn't get healed, the faith healer blamed the sick person and told, told them to come back with more faith and usually an offering. We'll deal with that one next. Fortunately, the Bible clears the air on this abusive teaching. When Jesus heals the cripple at Bethesda, the man didn't have a clue who Jesus was. 
let alone have enough faith. John 5, 13. In Luke 5, 17 through 26, Jesus did heal based on faith. He healed a man's soul through salvation. And when the Pharisees questioned his authority to forgive the lame man's sins, Jesus healed the man physically to prove it. Other times, Jesus was moved by people's faith, but this doesn't mean his healing touch was bound to whether they had enough faith. When the woman with the bleeding issue crawled through the crowd just to touch the hem of Christ's robe, his, he felt power leave him, Luke 8, 46. Jesus, moved by her faith, healed her, but he also told her of the healing that had taken place in her soul, saying, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in faith, uh, go in peace. Verse 48. Jesus called her daughter because he offered the greatest healing of all. She was now part of the family of God. So now the healing power of Christ. Um, so can the healing power of Christ be coerced by faith? No. Jesus is the great physician who focuses on healing the soul not merely the body. Truth three, God doesn't perform healing for a price. Simon the sorcerer tried to buy it in Acts 8, 9 through 25. Fortune tellers and witch doctors will sell it, and faith healers will tell you to sow your biggest seed to get it. As it has been throughout history, many people are convinced that healings like houses are for sale. When a beggar asked for a blessing in his cup, the Apostle Peter offered him something better and gave it to him for free, Acts 3, 6. This truth is pure, sweet, healing truth for your weary and burdened mind. You don't need to go broke to get healed. If Jesus can't be forced to heal by the right amount of faith, then it's unthinkable that the Alpha and Omega, uh, Omega can be bribed with money into healing you. No apostle, no testament writer, and not even Jesus himself ever told someone to give a financial seed for faith, of faith for a healing, a breakthrough, or protection from sickness. It is not God's will that you give money to be healed. Instead, it's God's will that you be liberated from such hurtful lies. Truth Four, God will heal all believers in heaven. The atonement brought, bought and paid for everything you and I could never afford. Christ died and paid the penalty of sin, whose consequences are sickness, tears, fears, the wrath of God, and eternal separation from God in hell. While all of this and more is provided for in, for in the atonement, Many of the blessings we'll experience won't be fully realized until heaven. While we have assurance of salvation through the faith in Jesus Christ here on earth, we don't live eternally until after we die. John 3, 16. Similarly, although we know this old decaying body will be replaced by a glorified one, 1 Corinthians 15, 50-53, it doesn't have matter how much you go to the gym. You won't have your ultimate body until you get to heaven. Finally, Christ said he is going to prepare a place for his disciples. John 14, 2 through 3. And that means us too. Yet many of us would hardly um, call our current home a heavenly mansion. Yes, all of the benefits of the atonement were paid for in Christ. But heaven is where we'll eternally enjoy them in the fullest sense. One day the trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ shall rise, death will be no more, he'll wipe away every tear, cancer won't exist, wheelchairs will be good only for scrap metal, blindness will be overcome by marvelous light, and the glorious blessings of the atonement will, will be realized once and for all in eternity. Some will experience the sovereign healing hand of God in this life, and others will suffer and not be healed until heaven. In every circumstance, let these truths from the word of God bring comfort to your soul and to your body. 
Your years of suffering and uncertainty are but a vapor here on earth. Your eternity of perfect joy will never end. Does God still heal today? As the unchanging and sovereign God, of course he does. He will, uh, his will cannot be thwarted, and there are those who are undeniably healed while on earth. But God heals according to his will and for his glory. Jesus lived with, with a thy will be done mentality throughout his life and ministry on earth. He even prayed those words as he prepared to suffer on the cruise, cross, Luke 22, 42. Under the greatest weight a man has ever carried, and in preparation to take the sin of the world on his divine shoulders, God the Son submitted his will to the glorious plan and purpose of the Father's will. This is a model that should resonate with every believer today. Can God heal? Yes. But sometimes he will glorify himself through your suffering, your sickness, and even your death. This counterintuitive way of thinking is foreign to the world. No wonder Peter calls believers foreigners, 1 Peter 2.11. We are a people called to an otherworldly perspective. We are different, even weird. Just think of how countercultural it is to believe that God will use your story for his glory, no matter what the outcome may be. That is the greatest honor in this life, greater than even physical healing in this life. Earlier in the chapter, I told you, that we discover truths about healing that would silence the lies you've been told. I hope you now see that you don't have to be lost and confused about Jesus and healing. More than that, you are not alone in your pain. Countless others are reading along with you, others who need the healing hand of Jesus to do what only he can do. And I am with you too as I write this to you. Certainly Christine and I cried out to God to heal our baby, Timothy even while holding fast to the truths I have outlined in this chapter. We clung to God's promises to be near the brokenhearted, Psalm 34, 18, and to be our strength in time of weakness, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9. And we kept reminding ourselves to seek Jesus in all of this, to remember who he is and what he has already done for us. What about you? What are you going through? Are you seeking to find Jesus and know him better, even in the midst of your trials? Do you know that Jesus is not only a healer? Of course you do. But isn't it so easy to forget? That's true for me. I can quickly get caught, so caught up in what I want and my own suffering that I begin to neglect and even forget who Jesus is. So we're not done. Not even close. The best part of the book is the rest of it. Are you ready? Let's discover the rest of Jesus, the Jesus who is so much more than just a healer. I got, I went a little bit over time today, so we're going to wrap it up with there. Um, let's close with a word of prayer. Oh, our gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for who you are. You are a healer, Lord, but you are so much more. Lord, I just pray for each of the ladies here in this class that you will help us to understand more of who you are and use whatever we're going through to draw closer to you and to hang on to the truth that you can heal. But even if you choose not to heal, you're going to bring glory through it all. And um, I just thank you for these things now. In Jesus' name. Oh. Oh, before I turn that off, it is called More Than a Healer by Costi Hinn. Not the Jesus you want, but the Jesus you need. Can you spell that author? Costi Hinn. C O S T I. Hinn. H I N N. The first group that you, you said you were going to tell us who it was after you read it. Uh, so I did. I just told you who it was. Who was it? Costi Hinn wrote it. So I'm sure you Benny recognize Benny the last name. Benny oh, Benny. Related oh, Benny. Benny. Oh, 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 Benny.